Okay, here we are. Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Wendy Rex Atzet. I'm the State Coordinator for National History Day in Utah. I'm a public historian and I work at the Utah Division of State History. And I am so happy to have this group of excellent colleagues gathered together to talk about why you might be interested in studying history in college. I think it's really, um, it can be difficult to know what you might be able to do with a history degree, even if you're interested in history when you're in school. And so, you know, we're all here to kind of give you some broad information and then answer your questions at the end. I am going to go through and introduce all of our panelists and then um, we'll get started. So we are joined by Ginger Smoke. She is a historian at the University of Utah. She studies medieval European history and she teaches in the Honors College. And then we have Shavana Munster, also with the University of Utah where she is the Black Student Union Advisor and she studies medieval European history. We have Brady Brower from Weber State University and his specialty is modern European history. We have John Felt from BYU and he studies medieval Chinese history and Victoria Grieve from Utah State University in Logan, who specializes in modern United States history. So with that, I am going to turn the time over to Ginger Smoke. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. I'm so happy that you could join us uh, today. And so think, what can we do with a history degree? So that's sort of the question, the task, right? So when I started thinking about it, I started thinking, well, what is it that people think about history majors or historians? And, and I think when we think about history, we think about facts. We think about one thing after another, right? We think about a history degree and we think about content and it is all of those things. But I will also say that in my many, many years about thinking, you know, thinking about these questions, I've realized that for, for me, the most important part of a history degree and a history education is the training and the skills required to not only study history, but also required for many occupations, many career paths. So I thought I'd talk about these skills a little bit. So what are these valuable skills that historians learn, that history majors learn, and how can we use them in um, other careers or other occupations? Um, the first one, the first valuable skill I think that we learn as uh, historians is critical reading and thinking, right? So what does law school, have to do with land management? What can we see across these different occupations? So I would say that they both demand that one be able to read critically, read a document, understand and interpret its purpose, its uh, point of view and bias, uh, its historical situation and context. So History trains us to think about documents and sources and issues contextually. Think about what motivations that a particular author might have in writing a document or uh, teach us how to ask good questions of a document, for example. Something that uh, I think is, is really important, right, for uh, every uh, subject, every discipline, and really most occupations and careers, if you think about that. Uh, and, and thinking about context, I think, is also extremely important in navigating everything from social media and news outlets to, um, uh, you know, specific uh, documents, legal documents, or land documents, right? So these critical reading and thinking skills are a key to success in most careers, I would say, and allow us to ask those good questions. 
The second really important skill that I think we learn uh, in a history education is interpretation and analysis. So likewise, interpretation and analysis of a source and the questions and the evidence that we are able to find about these questions is as vital to medicine as it is to government work or um, museum and archivist work. And so one of the things that we can see, for example, is uh, we can look at public history. Public historians who work in these public facing fields, uh, you know, they might be uh, in addition to museum and art, uh, museum and archivist work, uh, doing that kind of work. They might be historical co uh, consultants. They might work for document film companies or state agencies or even world heritage sites. So public historians work to answer questions posed by different groups of people. Um, so they might be hired, for example, by a Native American tribe to research the history of land and water rights so that they know their own uh, history in order to protect and preserve their rights today, for example. So this kind of work, these kinds of questions, you know, we have to be adept at analysis of data. We have to be able to interpret that data uh, for our bosses, for a wide audience, um, for a particular client. And so that skill really allows us uh, to contextualize and interpret. The third important skill I think that we learn in history education is research, argumentation, and writing. And I will say this, um, when asked what they look for in hires, the single most common response that employers give is good writing skills. So history teaches us to write well, to think well, to make a good argument backed up by evidence. Uh, it also teaches us, of course, these vital research skills that can be used as easily in science as humanities and social sciences. And most careers, I would say, require the ability to express oneself clearly, to write well, and to make strong and valid arguments in the information that they discover in their research. So that is uh, another thing that we learn in history education. And then finally, I think we learn an, an understanding of larger historical patterns and contingencies and how the past informs the present and actually the future, really, if we think about it that way. So without understanding the past and historical patterns, we are less able to recognize where our ideas and our systems and our institutions come from and why we're so invested in those, those things, those systems and ideas. And also how we might want to change them if it makes sense to do that. And so we can understand that history doesn't necessarily happen the way that it did because it's fate or predestination or something like that. It happens that way because of individual human actions, motivations, thoughts, interactions. So students of history can better understand uh, these systems and these contingencies and how we might change them in the future. We can better understand things like race relations or social justice or gender equity uh, and work in careers that focus on learning from the past to inform our present. So besides law school, we can be equally prepared for a career in social work or environmental policy or journalism, for example. And so by understanding the role that individuals have played in history, we can re recognize how important our own education and skill building, these vital skills that we get from a history education um, and cultural understanding is to our own lives and worlds and careers. So thank you. That's what I have to say.
Shivana, I believe you're up next. Yes, thank you. Um, and so many good points made my gender. Give me just a moment. I have a little PowerPoint. Oh, there we go. Okay. So going off of what um, Dr. Smoke was saying, I want to talk a little bit about why for your own personal interest, you may want to get into history. So for me, number one, getting into history was because I could explore what I wanted to, to a nerdy degree. So I'm really into the history of physical punishment and torture and medicine and how that's impacted the way people physically punish people. And I could go into Amnesty International, which yes, history degree would be great for that, but also I just wanted to research it. So history allows you to explore your interests in, in great depth. So here are a few covers of books that have come out in the last three months um, and some that are coming out in the next three months. And this is just a taste of what the expansive myriad of interests you could be exploring or topics you could explore. So here's one about fandom and the Beatles and how the behavior of fans really impacts society and things that the media is focused on and our societal interests. Charlie Brown's America, the popular politics of Peanuts. And so Charlie Brown and Peanut Strips, how that impacts and really informs us about the history of America. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this one's about mercenaries, pirates, bandits, and empires. So if you're interested in pirates, if you're interested in, you know, nautical wars, if you're interested in these topics, um, that's a possibility. And supernatural. Um, there was someone during my master's research that studied um, ghosts and the undead, so zombies, and how that was, how the history of the land and the environment really impacted those stories of supernatural ghost stories, folk tales, things of that nature. And so what really drew me to history is this wide array. If you're interested in something and you're like, you know, I don't know what I want to do after, um, after I'm done with school, what can I, but I'm really interested in this one topic and you really just want to research it into the ground <laughs> for me in some ways. That history really allows you to research not only how it impacts today and the history of that that topic contemporarily but really the history of it and how it came to be what it is today and how we look at different things right so history also allows you to drive the narrative so many sorry if you can hear that there are children outside my windows um so i want you to think about the history that you've been taught. So by this point, many of you have taken um, Utah history. If you're in Utah, I went to school here, or taking American history, depending on what grade you're in. So really think about the history that you've taken and that you've been taught. And where do these stories begin? Um, whose point of view are these stories told from? So if we think about, for example, the history of the Americas, right? We are often taught Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1492, and that's often where the story begins. There are a lot of, there's a lot of research during done, being done that revises this history, right? But largely that's where the narrative begins. However, if you shift that narrative and start that story from the perspective of one of the millions of people who lived in the Americas already, your minding your own business, doing your own thing, and then Christopher Columbus, the conquistadors, everyone shows up. That's considered invasion or massacre or, you know, a myriad of things. And it really changes the way that story is told and changes the entire history. It changes that story entirely. So really thinking about how these stories would be shifted, how the narrative changes, often if we don't see ourselves in history as the victors, as people who overcame, we won't see ourselves being able to do that in our own lives. And so being able to look at the different perspectives and shifting that, and really what's fascinating about being a historian and what really is exciting about, especially revisionist history, is going back and telling that different story, telling the story of those who are in, who story hasn't been told thus far. So 
finding yourself in history is really important. Driving that narrative from the point of view of someone who hasn't been talked about is really an important part of being a historian, if that's the route you choose to take. And finally, um, it under helps you understand what's happening now. So this photo on the left is an image from the last year of the Black Lives Matter movement and asking yourself, how can you really understand this? There's a lot of questions in the news, misunderstandings, confusion, uncertainty. How did we get to this point? And that question is really of historical context. How did we get here? And how can you truly understand what's happening now if you don't understand this picture on the right, which looks very much like pictures today, right? Change the hairstyle and put it in to color and it looks like today. However, this photo was taken, um, it's from a collage of photos taken from 1963 and 1964 during the civil rights movement. And it's very similar to what's going on today. And so when these questions come up of how do we understand the modern movements? How do we understand race relations? How do we get to this point? You need to understand where we've been and understand that history. And by researching history, doing that research, doing that broad reading, <clears throat> excuse me, you can get to that understanding. So re history really helps us understand where we are now. And next, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Brady Bauer from Weber State University to talk more about what historians and graduates of history do. Thank you. Thank you, Shivana. So um, when Wendy first reached out to me about uh, uh, being part of this panel, it just so happens that happened that I was in the midst of organizing uh, an event for our uh, majors here at Weber State uh, designed to show them uh, what sort of opportunities there were, at least locally in Northern Utah for, for our history majors. Um, and so what I wanna talk about a little bit today are this sort of specific jobs that uh, our majors uh, often pursue. And these are represented by uh, community participants who were part of this event that I was organizing. But before I go through the the laundry list of uh, occupations that historians often or sometimes uh, take up. I do want to kind of reiterate uh, some of the things that uh, Ginger and, and Shivana were talking about, uh, just in terms of history representing one of the best, if not the best, um, disciplines within a kind of general humanistic education, as it would have once been called. Uh, history gives you wide ranging knowledge, uh, you know, of different elements of human interaction over different periods of time, shows you patterns and relationships which might not have been uh, apparent to you. It also allows you to uh, see the world from multiple perspectives. And of course, that's one of the sort of crucial uh, issues of our time is being able to lift ourselves out of our own uh, narrow parochial perspective and, and uh, seeing the world uh, the way that others do. And history is an excellent, excellent discipline for that. It also gives us, as, as Ginger pointed out, these general uh, skills that are um, essential skills uh, for any human being, uh, but also sk skills that are very much in demand in the commercial marketplace, particularly skills in reasoning and the ability to use, process, analyze information, uh, and the ability to communicate. Um, one of the things that historians learn to do uh, very, very well is uh, that we, we learn to write. Um, and that uh, seems to be a, a sort of dying art in the age of text messaging and emails and so forth is, you know, good written, uh, written prose, long form thinking in a, in a written format. So um, I, I want to emphasize those kind of general skills that, that history uh, brings. And I think those general skills are important because we live in a, a rapidly changing time. Um, by the time many of the, the students here uh, grow up, uh, there may be jobs uh, that are in demand that don't even exist yet. And so it's important that you uh, come to the world with a set of skills which are flexible and adaptable and allow you to, to, to make your way uh, using a kind of core basis of competencies and skills and knowledge that you might develop in a discipline like this one uh, in history. So, so that, uh, that said, I want to sort of um, stress the the general qualities of, of history as an approach to education and point out some of the risks that might be associated with uh, specializing too much or maybe specializing uh, too, too early in your, your education and finding out that once you reach adulthood, 
what you've trained for, the, the skill you've trained for is now obsolete. Um, uh, I don't think that we're going to see uh, history as a, as a profession or as a discipline uh, reaching obsolescence any, anytime soon. History is an excellent, excellent training for any kind of professional field. Um, uh, and of course, its history is associated with the development of the professions, legal professions, teaching professions, um, uh, diplomatic professions uh, over the course of the, the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so in terms of what um, uh, our students often go out to do in the world, um, you know, obviously we have a number of students who will go into education. It's important to note that only a tiny minority of uh, history uh, undergraduate majors will go into higher education, who become university prof professors. And that number is, I think, around 4%. Uh, a much larger chunk will go into um, secondary education in junior high and high schools. And that's generally what um, people associate with the history major, that you're, you're going to go into, into high school and become a high school uh, teacher. That's not uh, the only outlet, of course, for, for history majors in terms of uh, careers and professions. Um, history majors can find uh, uh, careers for themselves in libraries and in, in archives. And those libraries and archives can take a number of different forms. They can be university uh, libraries or, or, or archives. They could be institutional archives, maybe associated um, with something like locally here, the, the LDS Church and the Joseph Smith Papers in Salt Lake City. Um, they, they can be uh, state archives. Um, uh, they could be federal archives as well. Um, some of the archivists that joined us for this career day event that I mentioned uh, were working at the Hill Air Force uh, Base Museum. Uh, and generally within any kind of branch of government service, there's a demand for people who can pro keep uh, maintain records so that these different uh, institutions and branches can um, maintain their own history, right? They can uh, write their own history. Um, uh, we had, uh, we've had students come from Weber State who've gone into editing and publishing. Uh, there's a local uh, textbook company here in, in Utah, uh, Gibbs Smith, which produces history textbooks for middle school uh, uh, students uh, on state histories. Uh, and they produce a, 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 a quite a comprehensive uh, state history uh, series that's edited here locally. Um, I, I've had two students who've worked as the executive editors for that uh, that particular uh, company, uh, which is in, I, I believe, in Farmington. Um, uh, we've had uh, students go on to law school. That's a very traditional path that, uh, that uh, history majors will take. Generally, when you look at lawyers, uh, they studied either, uh, you know, rhetoric or uh, English or uh, history as undergraduates, and so that's a that's a very a traditional path. My own father, who was a, a lawyer and later a judge uh, in Idaho, had studied history as an undergraduate, um, and it was his love of history that largely brought me uh, to the field. I think once he had gone on to becoming a lawyer, he kind of regretted. Uh, leaving history behind and, and specializing in, in law. And so I, I, uh, I sort of picked up where he left off. Um, we, you know, we also uh, have people who will work in museums as well. Um, so again, Hill Air Force Museum, uh, which also maintains its own archive. We had representation at our career day event from uh, the curator at the Union Station Museum here in Ogden. So that's another uh, traditional path that, uh, that historians will take. But I, I want to encourage you, and I, maybe I can share this link in the chat, to just explore some of the, the, the fields that uh, historians enter into outside of those that we traditionally uh, think of. Um, so this is a, a, an article from the American Historical Association, which points to the distribution of uh, different career paths that history undergraduate uh, majors might take. And you'll find that uh, you know, a good percentage of history majors are going into the private sector, into management and administration, um, and, um, uh, and, and not just into education as people so often think. So if you're studying history now and you have a sort of reluctance about uh, becoming a junior high school or high school teacher, you don't need to despair. There's a whole wide range of uh, careers just waiting there for you. And beyond that, there are careers uh, which you're going to be more than adequately prepared for in terms of the basic skills, competencies, and this, again, this wide ranging general knowledge that you'll develop as a, as a history major.
I'm next, right? Yes, John. Okay. Um, so good to uh, see you all here. And I just reiterate everything that's been said already. Uh, these have been great points. I want to highlight just two, two things. Uh, first is about the globalized world that we're living in and how the history degree prepares you for that. And then second is a couple of careers that um, our history majors here from BYU go on to uh, that you wouldn't associate with a history degree probably, but they're actually the, the first and the third most common careers to go into after this degree. So first globalization. I think the field of history has globalized far better than just about any other of the humanities or social sciences. Um, we're living in an increasing globalized world and no matter what profession you go into, you're going to have to deal with this globalized world that we are all a part of. And within our history department, we have specialists not only in America, but in Latin America and Europe and Africa and Asia. Um, we get specialists covering almost the entire globe. Um, the rise of world history, kind of the history of globalization has been growing over the past couple decades. Uh, and so a history degree can prepare you for globalization, I think in ways that even, even more than a degree in international relations can. I mean, the, the kind of specialization um, across the entire globe, I, I don't know if we can find any other department that has that um, more than just the history department does, which I think is, is really amazing. You know, there are lots of area studies programs, Latin American studies, Asian studies, Near Eastern studies programs, African studies, right? And we've got people in all of those in one department right here in the history department. Uh, so this is a degree, a major that prepares you for global awareness, global citizenship, um, and so lots of kind of jobs there engaging in this, this growing globalization of the 21st century. That's my first point. The second point is about some careers that uh, you might not traditionally associate with. At Air BYU, we track our majors and uh, what they're doing career-wise afterwards. And uh, the number one career after uh, for our graduates is not education and research. 23% um, of our majors go on to business management, administration, and consulting. Um, and I'll just give you one anecdote um, to sort of make sense uh, how, how a history major prepares you for that. I had a friend that I went, uh, that I took classes with here at BYU a long time ago. And um, I went to graduate school to become a professional historian. He went into business and he is a CEO now. And we just happened to end up recently in the same neighborhood. And uh, he talks constantly about how much he loved his history, history degree and how it prepared him for, for his field in business, how, how you know, deals are made over dinner and conversation. And because he's, you know, he has this history degree, he has interesting things to say, and, and that makes these deals a whole lot easier than his you know, uh, business degree associates or finance degrees or something like that. And this is related with my first point because so much more business is global in scope. And uh, my friend, his name's Don, he talks about how, you know, if you're able to talk with people from Asia about Asian history, it wins them over so quickly. They, they, they feel a connection to you. They see that you're not this arrogant American who thinks America's the center of the world. Um, and they, uh, it, it builds those connections uh, far more readily. And he's, he's just, he can't say enough how much his history degree prepared him for his career in business. Um, the second one that our majors go on to is in fact education and research, that's 17%. And the one after that is healthcare at 11% of our majors. So these are doctors, nurses, PAs. I've written lots of letters of recommendation for my students going on to PA school. 
and I, I, and I get to explain how history majors can be better doctors because Doctors are more than just encyclopedias, that they, they need that human touch and the history and the humanities in general um, prepare them for treating their patients like human beings. And, um, and that this history degree actually prepares them better for medical school. Yeah, they've got to do the prereqs, um, that's fine. That prepares them for uh, medical school, but the history degree prepares them to be better, his, uh, better doctors uh, because of that, that human touch uh, that they get from the study of actual human beings. And those are the two points that I wanted to add to the conversation. Thanks. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Victoria Grieve. I study U.S. history at um, Utah State, and my colleagues made so many awesome points that I feel like I can't really add anything, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, and I think what I want to ask you to do is to just take a step back and ask yourself what the point is of going to college. What's the point of a university education? Um, should we um, judge uh, the success of a college degree for what we're going to do next? Or should we judge it for what it's taught us? Um, should we pick our major based on future earning potential. And I think, um, you know, we're often presented with this decision as if it's an either or decision. And I'm here to tell you today that you can actually do both, right? Um, I think college is about um, gaining a useful education that, that will eventually enhance your quality of life. But obviously, whatever job you have is a huge part of your life. So if you love your job, and if you can pay your bills, then it, in, then it obviously contributes to a meaningful life as well. So I think for a lot of years, students and parents have been told that if you choose a humanities um, major, then you're destined for a life of underemployment and debt and ramen every night for dinner for the rest of your life. Um, and I think that, um, you know, they're told they're giving up the security of a kind of a predetermined career, like accounting, for example. No offense to any accountant parents out there. Um, but first of all, I think we know that job security in today's world is not guaranteed, no matter what you major in, no matter what field you're in. And secondly, I think um, not every teenager knows what they want to do with the rest of their life. And I have one, and I know that that is the case. Um, and career aspirations change over a lifetime. You may love being an accountant first and then change your mind later. And if you've only been trained in that one specific thing, um, it's harder to be flexible and to switch careers, whereas a humanities degree that builds on the skills that all of these colleagues have talked about so far allows you perhaps to, um, you know, change careers if you feel that that is the case that for you. So I just want to talk about three sort of myths that are out there about humanities degrees, not just history, English, philosophy, um, the humanities and social sciences in general. And I want to dispel a few of these myths. Um, the first myth, employers want STEM grads, right? Um, I think that you have heard from everyone instead that employers are really looking for employees who can communicate, who can get along with other people, who can creatively solve problems, who can think critically. Um, and here are some statistics to back me up here. LinkedIn, which is a kind of a professional networking um, website, um, they researched and found in 2019 that the employer's top three most wanted skills, soft skills, um, are creativity, persuasion, and collaboration, all skills that you learn in a humanities program. One of the top five hard skills was people management, people skills. And I think Dr. Felt was talking a little bit about that. Um, you learn how to engage in interesting ways with different people. Myth number two, there are no jobs for humanities degrees. Um, again, I think my colleagues have addressed this. Uh, I'm gonna pull up a little uh, slide here just to share some data with you. Um, so you can see here, maybe I can make this bigger. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is from the American Historical Association, which is our professional organization, like the AMA is for the American Medical uh, Association is for doctors. So you can see this chart, um, um, whereas the majority of um, 
history grads go on to education training and library. Uh, again, this doctor backs up Dr. Felt's point that management, business, science, and the arts, legal occupation, sales, office, and administration. So you are not limited just to teaching. There is an enormous array of, um, of positions available for all humanities degrees and not just history majors. And did you know, throw out some facts for you, uh, John Kennedy and Richard Nixon were both history majors. Mitt Romney and Steven Spielberg were English majors and JK Rowling of Harry Potter fame, she majored in French and classics. About 60% of American CEOs have humanities degrees. So um, my point is that there are lots and lots of options and you can go in many, many directions with a degree in humanities. And finally, the third myth here is higher unemployment for humanities grads and lower salaries. And I wanna show you this chart um, and we can look at the median here. So, uh, and I'm, you know, obviously there are differences. If we will look at the fifth, the median, the 50th percentile of humanities degrees, they make on average about $50,000 a year. Business degrees make on average about $60,000 a year. So there is absolutely about a $10,000 difference in annual salaries, median salaries between historians and business majors, right? All fields, however, if you look at this, all the median income for all of these fields is probably, well, I don't know, $58,000 a year. Again, my point being humanities majors are in no way stuck in McDonald's or eating ramen for dinner every night, right? They make a decent salary and can pay their bills because employers value the skills that you learn in a humanities program, okay? So back to my original point. Should we judge the, a degree based on earning potential? If you answered the question, yes, great. So there's about a $10,000 degree difference between uh, an English major and a business major. I think that that's a small difference that is, could be made up by loving your job, loving what you do every day and feeling like you're having a meaningful and fulfilling career. So if you love the humanities, don't let fear of poverty <laughs> keep you um, from doing that. Um, I would argue that we shouldn't judge a, a major that way. I think that uh, as my dad told me, he majored in business and he told me when I was a teenager thinking about college, do what you love because you're gonna spend the rest of your life going to work. And so you really want to enjoy that every day uh, and get pleasure from that. So um, I think, and, and I honestly think that employers want to know that you went to college, that you did well in college. And obviously if you love what you are studying, you're going to do well in that field. Um, so that's all I wanted to add to our conversation. And I would really um, much rather hear from you and answer some questions from students. So, um, and there is one right there in the chat, but Wendy, I'm gonna hand this over to you to manage that, I think. Okay. So I, I would invite everybody to turn, um, turn your video on. If you're comfortable being on screen, we welcome, we welcome your face into the conversation and we welcome you into the conversation and you're free to use the chat or um, to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. But I think I'll start with the question that Cami put in the chat just to get us going. She wants to know, how can I as a high schooler prepare for a humanities related career? or humanities related careers. And I will throw this out to any of our panelists who would like to take it. I can start. I think what's really important with history, it's not like say an accounting degree where an accounting degree prepares you to be an accountant. Right? Um, the history degree can prepare you for a lot of different jobs and so you need to think proactively about what the end goal is and think, um, you know, start with the end in mind, right? Where do I want to end up after I get this degree? What career is it that I want? And then the history degree provides a lot of flexibility for you to shape that degree in ways that will lead you to that end goal. So, um, so the first thing I would tell you is, you know, nobody's going to hold you to this career. You're still, you know, in high school, but like have an idea of what the goal is 
um, and then start talking with people in that field um, and setting your own course. And that sort of flexibility is one of the nice things about, about the humanities and, and history. You know, so much of the sciences are like, the, the program is so like spelled out, you have to take the, you know, this class and this class in this order. Um, and so the freedom is nice, but it's also, it puts the onus on you to figure out how I'm gonna chart this course myself. So talking to people who are in the field that you wanna go into, there are often career counselors at the university that will be very helpful to suggest summer internships that can move you towards that and which particular classes will move you towards that goal. But first of all, you've got to think like, what is the goal in mind? Cami, I think you're, you're off to a good start just being here today. <laughs> and I think um, Dr. Felt makes a really good point. Talk to the teachers at your school that you love their classes. Um, you know, ask them why they do what they do. Ask them how they ended up there. Um, uh, you know, if you're interested in history, go to some museums uh, and chat with the people who work there. They would be thrilled, I, I guarantee you. <laughs> I'd also say read widely. Um, if you are interested in something, make sure you're reading all different types of books from all different types of authors and if there's one person's name that keeps coming up research them google them especially if they're in academia their cv um, which is a professional resume um, or an academic resume will be online and you can look through their whole history and see what are they reading what are they researching how did they get to where they are also and you can reach out to them um, as the other panelists have said, but I would say also making sure that you're reading a wide array of topics so that you know what options are. I was just going to add, I guess I don't need to uh, take advantage of opportunities like uh, National History Day, right? <laughs> and also the resources that are available in your school while you're doing your, your History Day project, make sure that you take advantage of uh, what's in the library. My, my wife is a high school librarian and one complaint that she often has is that students, even if they're assigned research projects in their history classrooms, they don't sort of go beyond the Google level of, um, you know, in terms of exploring what sort of uh, resources are available, primary sources, secondary sources, and all of those things are available for you in your school. So uh, spend time in the library, get to love the library and, uh, you know, the library is a place of discovery. You might accidentally stumble across something that you never knew existed uh, before, some event in history or approach to historical writing. Um, and, and, you know, that might inspire you to, to, to undertake some bigger work or project in the, in the future. So take advantage of all the opportunities in your school and all the resources that are available for you. Um, is it all right if I ask another question? Oh, this is Cami speaking, by the way. Hi, Cami. Yeah, go ahead. And then we have a couple more questions waiting in the chat as well. All right, sounds good. So just as a quick follow up, or like essentially why, what led you guys to pursue your interests? Like what motivated you? I, I can sort of answer that and also piggyback on what Dr. Brower was just saying. Um, I was a biology major until my junior year. And the biology classes were fine. But I started taking history classes for fun and realized that I was having way more fun doing thinking historically, doing the history assignments than I was doing the stuff I was supposed to be doing. And then I started, um, I went to the library and I just sort of started wandering around in the stacks and looking at the books and just grabbing books. And I have to tell you, I became a historian because of the smell of books. I know that sounds weird to people, especially now, because we tend to read things online and it's wonderful that we have so many options now 
uh, to read documents online, but there's nothing better than that smell of old parchment and paper and documents. So that's, that's why I did it. <laughs> I would love to contribute an answer to this too, because I'm, I'm another person who came to history awfully late. Um, after I had finished my undergraduate degree in communication, because I loved writing, um, I started taking history classes for fun. And same, very much a similar experience because I realized very quickly that it fundamentally changed how I understood the world and how I interacted with people. And I think you've heard a lot of the professors talk about that. And I really do think, um, that it answered a lot of questions I didn't even realize I had. And uh, that's a big part of why I absolutely love getting to work with National History Day because because I get to help people make those discoveries a lot younger than I than I did. Should we move on to the next question? Shailen has a good one. How would a history degree affect being a lawyer? Would it help or would it not be the smartest option for a career in law? Anybody? Anybody know any lawyers very well? I've got a graduate who's headed off to the University of Utah Law School this next semester. So I would say, again, I think as I, I was saying, uh, you know, among the different undergraduate disciplines that you could study in preparation for law school, history is probably among the best, uh, with maybe English in there somewhere as well, because uh, both are going to contribute to your ability to formulate arguments, to tell compelling stories, um, to reason effectively, making use of evidence. Um, and they're going to both give you both the written competencies, the ability to write clearly uh, and express logical uh, arguments in writing, but also to do so um, you know, orally as well. So I would say that if you're interested in a Korean law, history would be an ideal discipline for you to consider as an undergraduate college student. Yeah. All right, let me go to the next question. Um, do the people who work for National Geographic tend to have history majors? That's such a good question. <laughs> I can't say I know the answer to that exact question, but I think um, a history degree would prepare you uh, and does prepare people for careers in journalism. Um, more broadly. So certainly if you're interested in a career in journalism, you could major in journalism, but you could also major in history and have, you know, a slightly deeper understanding of the issues that you are talking about. You understand where the issues have been and you can, you understand context. And I think that really um, enlivens and sort of deepens the understanding of journalists when they have a, his, a history background. Um, so I think it would be an excellent um, major for you if you're interested in, in journalism, for sure. I agree with that. I, I was going to say that, um, you know, understanding not just the, the cultural context, but giving yourself a wide perspective. Um, and that's true, really. I mean, I don't know if anybody you know, watches The Simpsons or anything like that. But if you ever watch The Simpsons and actually pay attention, the jokes are all historical. So it helps you to understand m not just multiple cultural perspectives, but also things like why things are funny or, you know, um, for law school, back to that question, it helps you understand where did legal where did legal practice come from? Go back to Greece and Rome. Think about context there. So I don't know about the National Geographic either, uh, the answer either, but probably. And I, I just want to add that Conan O'Brien, who was a longtime writer for The Simpsons, was a history major as well. <laughs> and something um, on John's Zoom background, those are all places that history majors have worked or do work. And so like the History Channel, um, National Park Service, National Geographic, all of those places. But history also 
um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, teaches you to take in a large amount of information and synthesize it into two to three pages, which can be really difficult. Um, and when you get into courses where they're like, you need to read three books and synthesize it into three pages, um, that can come in really yeah, handy and really useful in a lot of different um, careers, so like law school or journalism or editing or all of these, you take large amounts of information and just the important parts and then have to spit that back out. So it's a lot of careers can really use that. Does anyone on have another question they would like to ask? Maybe I'll just add on to what Shivana just said. Uh, one of the, you know, going into the 21st century, globalization is going to be an issue. But one of the other big issues of the 21st century is going to be artificial intelligence. And there are a lot of jobs that artificial intelligence will replace. But the job of taking a lot of information and synthesizing it into a coherent, persuasive message is not something that artificial intelligence does well. But those are the skills that you get in a history degree. And so those are the, those are the careers that will not be displaced by the AI revolution that will certainly happen within your lifetime. That's a great point. I'm going to toss in some questions that came in um, ahead from um, Kailana, and she's, she's curious. She has a lot of really good questions. I'm going to focus on two. What made you want to be a history major, and what keeps you motivated? So I'm going to jump in on this one. So I, similar to what my um, colleagues on here have said, I didn't get into history until way late in the game. Um, I was a culinary major and two classes away from finishing my certified chef and realized I was reading my history textbooks. It was required history um, textbooks, so it wasn't history for fun, but I found myself reading those instead of reading the culinary textbooks that I was required to do. So that really showed me maybe this is the way to go. And then I started reading Sharon K. Penman, my favorite historical author, and really thought, you know, I could do this. I could write historical fiction. And so I majored during my undergrad in history with a minor in creative writing with the eye to go towards um, writing and historical fiction in that way. And so it really, that's what motivated me is seeing that um, Sharon K. Penman would go to these places and look at the foundations and look at the archives and read these manuscripts and then write these absolutely beautiful and compelling series about um, Llewellyn and the Welsh princes and King John and King Richard. And that really got me interested and really made me look at, these are actual people. Like, it's not just like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln who were also people, but there's so many people and stories and point of views that we don't talk about. And that really kept me motivated. Like, no, these are actual people that went to these places and did these things. And you can stand where the Medici's were and then you cry like I did. But it really, that's what keeps me motivated is these are real humans and these are real stories and you could do what they did. Like that, yeah, sorry, ran off. <laughs> I think I have a slightly different story. I was the first grader in the stacks, you know, consuming biographies of Abraham Lincoln, you know, when I was seven. And I knew from the time I was little that I was going to be somehow involved in, in history. Um, and I just consumed books and I just loved learning in that way. And, um, but what really made me want to become a professional historian, as opposed to the different things that you can do with a history degree, is that um, I really love school. I love it. And I wanted to be a student for the rest of my life. And that's essentially what I do right now, right? I get to take classes, I get to read interesting books, and I get to hang out with like 20 year olds all the time, which is really good as you get older to hang out with 20 year olds. Um, and so it's just such an interesting job because you never stop learning. And if you love to learn, I get to do that every day, right? And it's just, uh, that's what keeps me motivated. It's just fun. Uh, 
I'll say one of the things that keeps me going is so like some of the others, um, I didn't start out as a history major. I started out as a math major. And what I liked about math was that it allowed me to see the world in a different way. Um, seeing the world through kind of numbers and calculations and the order of the universe. But in a similar way, history gives me eyes to see the world in a different way too. And that's sort of what keeps me going that, that like, when you realize the world as it is right now, it's really easy to just assume that's the way it's always been. But when you study history, you see that the things we believe and the, the way we act started at a certain point in time. And that means they're going to end at a certain point too, that, that it de-essentializes the world that you live in right now. It means the, the world that you live in right now is not the way it was in the past, and it's not going to be that way in the future. And that allows you to kind of see the world, why we're doing the things that we're doing, uh, why we behave the way we do. This all was constructed at a certain point in time, and we're constantly reconstructing it in our lives, and we will continue to reconstruct it in new and dynamic and different ways into the future. And that kind of vision of kind of de-essentializing the way things are right now is just what makes history endlessly fascinating to me. Yep, part of the motivation uh, comes from the fact that the stories that we, for instance, tell our students in our classrooms change. Uh, they evolve. Um, and that's also part of what makes you know, being a history teacher, at least for me, exciting is that the students come to my classes with questions about the world that they're living in. They want to understand the world better. They want to understand, you know, geostrategic or geopolitical uh, shifts that are taking place. They want to understand where these extremes of political right and left come from. And the, the way you explain those to students by looking back into the past, those stories change. The emphasis shifts uh, as the stories adapt to these new questions that student, students bring. I mean, my, the students I have in my classroom now are ask very different questions than the students I had when I first started university level teaching 15 years ago. Um, and so th that's, that's exciting to see and it places a constant kind of uh, burden on me to find new explanatory models and different stories to help them um, to, to answer the questions that they're bringing to the classroom. So that's, that's part of my, my motivation as a teacher. I might just just remind everybody that you know just because we also we started out as biologists and mathematicians and chefs and you know communications doesn't mean we can't also do those things we, there's different kinds of history there's there's multiple approaches to history so if we like math, for example, we might work with quantitative history and numbers and statistics and data. If we want to look at um, the, the people who don't normally show up in, um, you know, official records, we might become social historians. Um, so, you know, there's military history, there's diplomatic history, there's economic, you name it, there's different approaches. So you can keep all of those interests and food history, right? <laughs> yeah, basically anything that you love now, whether it's sports or cooking or uh, technology or, or politics, all of those things have their own, their own history. So you can continue to explore those interests as a historian, math, history of mathematics, history of science. Yeah, and I will add, I'm, thank you, Ginger, for directing the conversation this way. One of the professors that I worked with when I was getting my degree in Boulder was also in her second career, and she had been a veterinarian, a large animal veterinarian in the country, in Colorado. And, um, you know, very similarly to those of us who found ourselves reading a lot of history and then thinking, hey, maybe I should make a change here. Um, so she is now a historian of science. She does really pioneering work on animal history, um, veterinary medical history, 
And history really does lend itself to that kind of interdisciplinary work very, very well. So we have, we've been on for about an hour and I don't want to stop conversation. If there are more questions, we'd be happy to continue to talk, to talk with you guys. I have a quick question, just like as another, I guess, follow up to just the researching process. But as historians, what are your researching process on things that you find interesting? like a step-by-step -step method or whatever? Oh, hello? Yeah, we're here. Uh, we're all, we're all here, we're just, we're thinking because we probably all have different approaches. Oh, oh you're totally fine. Um, I'd say just, but yeah. actually, go ahead, Brady, sorry. Oh, I mean, I, th I think you just, you, you know, you want to begin by learning a little bit about the topic that you're interested in, just in its general contours. And then you want to start, uh, you know, working towards a bibliography, you know, build a, a list of, uh, of authors who are recognized authorities on your question or your, or your topic, and then begin exploring the, that secondary literature is what we would call it, right? These histories of the topic that you're interested in. Um, and from that, you can begin to build a kind of more thoroughgoing understanding of the questions that other historians have presented to this subject or this topic, how they've gone about trying to answer those questions, where they've gone in terms of their primary source materials. I mean, uh, you can also start with the project by discovering some kind of primary source that has some kind of intrigue or interest for you, maybe something that you accidentally stumble across online uh, and you want to learn more about it. You want to figure out how to contextualize that. And then so you might build from a primary source to the secondary sources that might help you to be better understand uh, that primary source. You know, maybe it's a historical uh, work of art or fiction or something like that that you're particularly interested in. You want to understand what the narrative motifs are, what kind of symbolic language the, the work of art or, or literature is using. And you need to understand the cultural context a little bit better to do that. And then so you might move from the primary source into the into the secondary sources. I mean, we can get obviously a lot more specific than that in terms of directing you towards res resources and and so on. You know, how do you build a bibliography is always a is a, always a question that my students struggle with. Uh, and there's a whole process that we take them through to show them how to do that. Yeah, I'll just add on a little bit to that. I mean, just, just what was said, start out reading broadly, get a good scope of, you know, how people have talked about it in different ways, and then find some sort of gap in the information that you're able to make a contribution to. Um, but I would just add to that, that good research is always question driven. So starting off with questions. Um, and that, that's going to allow it to be interesting to you and motivating and meaningful to the audience that you eventually present it to. So good research is always question driven. Going off of that, most of um, my research will start with reading different books, um, as you said, looking at different articles, what people are talking about. And usually it comes from that close reading and finding, having a question myself, like, well, why are they talking about it this way? or what's missing here? What gap is there in the research? And I find it most helpful once I have a topic I'm interested in to have that conversation with someone who's not a historian. Um, I have a couple of really close friends who are, I consider my little editor group. Um, some of them are philosophy majors, some of them are ended up being chefs, and a couple musicians. And I pull them all into a room and I ask them like, what do you think about this? And usually the questions that come out of that by people who are not historians are completely different than the ones you'll come up with when talking to historians. And sometimes those are the best questions because they have no idea what you're talking about most of the time. And you nerd out about things and they're like, back up, I don't understand this word. So that really helps to drive my research and is really helpful when you get down to actually writing the paper because you have all the information in your head and you'll often write point A and then point E, but you've missed B, C, and D. So you need to go back and fill in those blanks and answer those questions that other historians 
may have or don't have. Um, but that's very much what has been said by others is our research is very question driven, whether that's your question or questions that come up in conversation. I'll just add one other thing. Um, I am interested in studying the Cold War. And so when the Soviet Union fell apart suddenly, and this was hugely exciting for historians because archives that had never been opened before, the doors opened and there were just millions of sources that historians had never used before. And so change happens, things happen like that, and new sources contribute to new understandings of things. And um, it's just exciting. Um, and it, it led to a, a whole shift in understandings of the Cold War with those new sources from the Soviet perspective. So it was really an exciting time um, for historians in that field, and it still is. <clears throat> Well, I feel, I feel like this has been such a fun conversation. And I think I'm going to speak for the panelists and say it has been such a pleasure talking to you all about this and answering your questions. And we want to encourage you, um, you know, to honestly follow your passion. <laughs> if there are no other questions today, I think we can, we can call it a night and say goodbye. Thank just you all. You this is so there. fun. Thank you so much. This was really beneficial. Feel free to reach out if you want to talk more. I was going yeah. to say that. Yeah, if you, when you get to the point where you're going to make a commitment to history, maybe you want to find our email addresses online and reach out to us and ask us a little bit more about our programs. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.